As you know, in Darktable 3, Filmic got changed to Filmic RGB. What's the difference and what do either of those two modules intend to do to your image in the first place? Are some of the questions that we will answer in this particular episode. Let's go. Hi and welcome to episode 57 of Understanding Darktable. So Filmic, if you haven't already watched the first video, I'll throw a link to it in one of the corners, uh, you should probably go and have a look, that was introduced in Darktable 2.6. And what it is designed to do is to bring to our images a look that resembles the way saturation behaves in film. And when I say film, I mean, you know, film, film. Film doesn't saturate the same way that digital images saturate. With digital photography, saturation is pretty much linear meaning that the amount of saturation you get in the deep shadows is equal to the amount of saturation you get in the midtones, which is equal to the amount of saturation you get in the highlights. But film doesn't behave like that. With film, it's more of an S-curve. So the majority of the saturation happens in the midtones, and as you move towards highlights and you move towards shadows, film progressively and smoothly desaturates so that by the time you get to pure white and pure black your saturation is at zero in other words you you really are monochrome at pure white and pure black now obviously different film emulations behave a little bit differently to each other but as a general principle as you move towards the extremities of luminosity saturation decreases with film where with digital photography it doesn't. So Filmic, and now in Darktable 3, Filmic RGB, are designed to help emulate that saturation curve that when you shot on film, you would naturally get. So for this particular episode, I've chosen a couple of images from last year. One is this shot of Julie, which was shot in the shade with a little bit of fill flash coming in from her left side, camera right, uh, the, the flash was inside the room that we can't really see. And as you can see from the histogram, I've underexposed this image quite a lot. I'm not sure why I did that, I probably just wasn't paying attention. So I've done a minor tweak to the white balance, but beyond that, the image is straight out of camera. So if we now go and grab the Filmic RGB module and turn it on, straight away the image lightens up a little bit. And what we want to notice right away is that there is a new interface to Filmic RGB. I do love the fact that this is a little less screen real estate intensive to the old Filmic module. It's been broken up into three tabs, Scene, Look and Display. And if you haven't watched Aurelian's video or if you did try and watch it and found it a little bit too technical, essentially what these three tabs represent is the Scene tab is all about setting a baseline for our RAW file. In other words, making up for minor or depending on your level or lack of skill, major issues with the original exposure as it was captured in camera. So hopefully, you know, the, the image you shot was close, but if there was just, you know, slight deficiencies in the exposure that you captured, then the scene tab of Filmic RGB is all about correcting that and setting a baseline from which we can then move on to the look tab, which is where we will do our creative manipulation of our image. And then the display tab, according to Aurelian's video, 99% of the time you're not even going to need to change anything on this particular tab. If I've understood Aurelian correctly, you would only modify the settings in the display tab if you were working professionally in post-production and you knew the display properties of the device on which the final image was going to be viewed. 
So in other words, if you were creating images that were going to be displayed on a particular type of device that, you know, maybe had a display property that was unusual, maybe it was super bright, maybe it was not particularly bright, whatever, then you might come in and adjust these values. But really, for 99% of us, we'll never need to go to the display tab. Okay, so coming back to the scene tab, it's all about setting a baseline, as I said. So the first thing we want to do is create a mid-gray point, or at least take a reading of a mid-gray point. Now, just as an example, I just want to quickly jump over to the color group and switch on monochrome. And then I'm going to come back to the modules that I've got that are active. Now, why did I do that? Well, as photographers, we should, at the time of exposure, be looking at the scene through our viewfinder, regardless of whether you have an optical viewfinder or an electronic viewfinder, and asking ourselves, if what I am seeing through the viewfinder was monochrome, what would be middle grey? Or which part of this composition would I want to represent middle grey? And if you're shooting portraiture, most of the time, that's going to be skin tones. So, with that in mind, we could sit here and drag the mid-grey luminance slider left and right and try and pick it for ourselves, or we could click on the eyedropper icon. Straight away, it's going to select an area of you know, roughly 98% of the entire image, but we can now left-click and drag across a part of the image to say, this is what I want to represent middle grey. So I'm just going to drag across her face and say, to my mind, that should be our middle grey point. Now, if we were working on a different image, we might have a different approach, but go with me for now. So we will unclick that. And right now, I no longer be, need to be looking at this as a monochrome image. So I'll just turn off the monochrome module. So now I've got my mid-gray luminance set. And the mid-gray luminance is this orange dot on the graph. And as you can see from the tooltip, this is a read-only graph. You can't click on the dots on the graph and drag them around to manually tweak things. This is not like a tone curve. Use the parameters below to set the nodes, the bright curve, and by bright curve, he means the, the white curve with the three dots on it, is the filmic tone mapping curve. In other words, that curve is showing you what the filmic RGB module is actually doing to your image. The dark curve is the desaturation curve. And by dark curve, he means this sort of thin gray curve here. Now, the desaturation curve is showing us which proportion of our shadows are being desaturated, which proportion of our highlights are being desaturated, and the point at which this line disappears off the right edge of the graph and off the left edge of the graph is showing us how much desaturation is occurring in the deepest shadows and in the brightest highlights. And you'll notice that it doesn't actually go right down into the bottom left corner of the graph or the bottom right corner of the graph. So what that's telling you is that the deepest blacks and the brightest whites are not being completely desaturated. They're being mostly desaturated, but not completely. We can change that when we get to the look tab but we're not there yet. Okay, so we've set our middle gray luminance. Next, we can use the white relative exposure and the black relative exposure to set the extremities of our histogram. So we can drag our white relative exposure to the left to increase our white point, and we can drag our black relative exposure to the right to decrease our black point. Now, if you find that you cannot get the white point to where you want it, 
at the right hand side of the histogram without driving the blacks into clipping then it probably means your mid gray point is not accurately set and what i have found in testing here is that as i try and set the white point i'm driving the blacks into clipping more than i want to and i then try and use the black relative exposure point to get that back yeah i'm kind of in the ballpark but what i could do is then manually tweak the mid gray luminance if i wanted to go there like i said we really should be using you know an area of skin tone to set our mid gray luminance so i'll trust aurelian's maths and leave it at that value so now we have set a baseline for this image now we can move on to the look tab and get creative with what we do with the image. Now, as I said earlier, this graph is not something that you can just click and drag points around on. But what we want to recognize here is that the orange dot represents our mid-gray luminance. The white dot up here represents the point at which full saturation starts to get tapered off as we move into highlights. So that's the point at which this thin gray line curve starts to move away from full saturation on the highlights. Correspondingly, the white point down here represents the point at which our shadows start to be desaturated. The shadow and highlights balance allows us to move these two white points relative to the mid-gray luminance value. The extreme luminance saturation allows us to change the point at which this thin gray curve hits the extremities. So the, the blackest blacks and the whitest whites. So remember earlier I was saying that at the moment that tapers off not in the very deep corners but actually part way up the y-axis of this graph. So what that's telling us is that at the moment, complete desaturation does not actually occur. At our blackest blacks and our whitest whites, we've got mostly desaturated pixels, but not 100%. And that's where the extreme luminance saturation control comes into play. If we drag this down, we can drag it to the point where this graph goes right into the corners, which means we are hitting maximum desaturation right at black and right at white, but everything else is just varying shades of desaturation. If we drag this further, you can see that we are actually creating complete desaturation at values brighter than pure black and at luminosities that are less than pure white. So we're creating complete desaturation for more of the pixels in the image than just pure black and pure white. As we drag that value higher, we are once again saying, I don't want complete desaturation, I just want partial desaturation at black and at white and varying desaturation from those points up to whatever points I've defined as the, the curves, if you like, for the protected midtones. Okay, the latitude control allows us to control the spread of midtones that are protected. In other words, which retain their levels of saturation. So as we reduce that value, the range of values that are being desaturated increases. And the range of values that are protected decreases. Like I said, all of this panel, this look tab, is just about your creative intent for the image. For me, I'm going to leave that at 45%. Now, you might be thinking, the shadows and highlights balance. Do I want to push this so that the graph 
is evenly distributed? Well, I'm kind of in two minds on that. One side of me says, yeah, that's what I want to do. But the other side of me recognizes that this graph is not linear. It's logarithmic. I can tell that by where the mid-gray luminance is. It's not right in the middle of the graph here. It's right over here to the right-hand side, which tells me that this graph is logarithmic. So I probably don't want to try and balance that output graph visually. Like I said, all comes down to creative intent. Okay, moving on. Down the bottom here, we've got preserve chrominance. And you will notice that there are four values if we consider off to be a value. The default is RGB power norm. The other two, max RGB and luminance Y, will respectively darken the blues with the max RGB setting and darken the reds with the luminance Y setting. So if we select luminance Y here, you can see that her shirt became darker. And you can watch the response on the histogram as well. The RGB power norm is essentially a trade-off between the two. To be honest, in most of the images I've played with in preparing to do this video, I found that there wasn't a whole lot to be gained by changing these values away from the default of RGB power norm. Obviously, if you have an image that has extreme reds or extreme blues in it, play with those two options and see if you find something that gives a, an image that's more like what you had in your mind. But like I said, for me, I've found very little reason to muck around with those values. Okay, so I'm going to leave this image where it is, and we're going to move on to the other image that I chose for this episode, and that is this particular landscape here. Now, again, I've just done a minor tweak to the white balance and I've done some retouch just to get rid of some dust spots that were on the sensor at the time I took this shot. But other than that, I've done nothing to modify this image. As we can see, the exposure was pretty good. Let's just go and turn on our Filmic RGB module. And once again, I want to go and turn on Monochrome and ask myself, which part of this image should be middle gray? I feel like this area down here in the bottom right represents shadows. All of this forest of trees that's growing up the side of that mountain is deep shadows. The sky is fairly bright. I feel like the bottom part of this tree trunk is sort of the middle gray that I'm imagining for this image. So with that in mind, I will turn monochrome off and on the Filmic RGB module, I'm going to jump to the scene. I'm going to grab this eyedropper and I'm going to draw an area on this part of the tree trunk. And I'm saying that's my idea of middle gray. Now, if you will remember from the original video that I did and from the original documentation that Aurelian wrote up for the filmic module, the concept was to set this middle grey luminance so that the majority of your histogram sat evenly distributed across the middle vertical line. So just to take that approach, that would have me setting a mid grey luminance somewhere around 7.14, where when I used the eyedropper tool, I was around about 9.83. Okay, fine. Let's go for a value of 8. Let's just split the difference. So we've set our mid-gray luminance. My relative white point could come up a little bit. My relative black point is probably okay where it is. Yeah, maybe I'll just... Yeah, maybe no, maybe I'm going to bring it all the way across to make sure that my black point is not clipping. I still don't need to use the dynamic range scaling because there aren't extremes of exposure in this image. We'll come back to that as I promised. Now we'll jump across to the look tab 
In terms of the shadows and highlights, I'm pretty okay with where that is. Let's just look at these other preserved chrominance values. Remember, max RGB will darken the blues. That's weird. I could see it in the histogram, but I didn't really notice a difference in the image. Let's just set that back. Yeah, interesting. I, I don't really see a difference. And, and as I said before, I've mucked around with this on multiple images. Most of the time, I don't see a need to bother changing the preserved chrominance value. You obviously, you know, go with what works for you. As I said, this look tab is all about your creative expression for the image. All right, so again, I'm just going to leave it at that. The display tab, once again, 99% of the time, you really do not need to muck around with these settings. They will be fine as long as your input and output color profiles are set. And with Darktable 3, by default, the input color profile is set to a standard color matrix as an input, and the working profile has been set to Linear Rec 2020 RGB. Now, Linear Rec 2020 RGB, as I understand it, is a wider color gamut than either sRGB or Adobe RGB. So you really should not have a need to change the working profile. That should be plenty wide enough for what you're working with in your raw files. And then the output color profile by default will be sRGB. And you would only change this if you knew you were going to print with a CMYK process, in which case you might go to Adobe RGB or you might go to Linear Pro Photo RGB or you might have reasons for choosing one of the other options. But for 99% of us who are simply preparing images for digital display, leaving that at sRGB will be fine. So with that said, there's really no need to go and change any of the values on the display tab in Filmic RGB. Okay, I found another image. This was an outtake from my shoot a couple of years ago with Tammy in the vineyards. As you can see, this was a little bit overexposed. So if we turn on the Filmic RGB module, immediately it looks even worse. And one thing I didn't mention earlier was the auto-tune levels. Now this, again, if you use the eyedropper, will look at the entire image and take a best guess at what it thinks the values should be for everything in both the Scene tab and the Look tab. Now, obviously, exposure here is too hot. So what I will do is turn that off, select Reset, and I'm going to manually choose my mid-gray point, and I'm going to go with her skin, but I think there's probably too much exposure. Yeah, her skin's probably cooked a little bit in the raw file. If we were to look at the raw over and under exposure... Yeah, certainly her shirt was overexposed and you can see that parts of her skin were overexposed as well. So I'm going to turn off the auto-tune levels. I'm going to reset the module. And because there is overexposure in this image, Filmic might not behave nicely, but we'll see how we go. So first up, I'm going to push all of the histogram data into bounds as much as I can. And then with the dynamic range scaling, as I drag that to the right, that will allow me to compress the dynamic range of the data from the raw file so that I can at least get everything into the histogram graph without there being clipping of the white or black point. Now, obviously the raw data itself is clipped, so we're limited with what we can do. But we can now choose our white relative exposure and our black relative exposure. And so that is, in theory, our baseline. Obviously, it's still overexposed. There's nothing I'm going to be able to do about that. 
but we can jump over to the look tab we can now change our highlight and shadows balance if we want to we can change the latitude of how much preservation of saturation occurs we can change the contrast if we want to and something I have yet to mention is these orange lines at the top right and bottom left of this white curve graph. They represent the amount of your image which is being clipped. This is not about saturation and desaturation, simply about clipping occurring at the highlights or the blacks of your image. So as you drive that contrast value, you will see those orange lines getting longer, showing that there is more and more clipping happening at the extremities. Like I said, I don't think I'm going to be able to do anything with this image because I did overcook it at the time of capture, uh, but I did want to at least demonstrate how that dynamic range scaling slider can be used when you do have massive extremes of luminosity within an image. Oh, one thing I have yet to address. What actually changed between Filmic and Filmic RGB? Well, part of the clue is in the name. The new module works in the RGB color space where I believe the original Filmic module worked in the lab color space. Now, for those of you who used the Filmic module in version 2.6 and 2.6.2 and 2.6.3, can you still use it? Yes and no. On those images which you processed in a 2.6.x version of Darktable using the Filmic module, you will still have access to the original Filmic module in Darktable 3. But the moment you deactivate that module, you will never get it back. So if you still want to use the original version of Filmic, you need to keep an install of 2.6.x on your system. Once you move to Darktable 3, you will only have access as a new module to Filmic RGB, which will as the name suggests, work in the RGB color space. So any images you have previously processed using Filmic, yes, you'll still be able to get to the Filmic module. Any that you have never used Filmic on, you will not be able to access the Filmic module. You will only be able to access Filmic RGB. In terms of the code underneath, my understanding is, from having watched Aurelian's video, which I'll link to up there somewhere, is that none of the code has changed with regards to the maths except for the use of the color space. That's the only difference between the two. And from what I've read and the little that I understand, Darktable is kind of moving towards a complete RGB workflow. Now, I don't know what the pros and cons are, and someone did ask me that in the comments to the last episode. Um, so I'm not entirely sure. I will try and find an answer to that and address that in an upcoming video. So that pretty much does it for Filmic RGB. If I haven't answered all of your questions or if I've created more questions than provided answers then again, I would suggest go and check out Aurelian's video. It's mathematically pretty intense, uh, but hopefully it will answer some more questions for you. If it doesn't, sing out in the comments down below, and if I can't answer it, I'll try and find someone who can. Okay, guys, I think that does it for this episode. I'll catch you in the next one.